showers. Uh, there's a, some terminology that uh, a number of different words for more or less the same thing. You see here radiation and the, from the initial part on. You can call it radiation. Often it's called the initial state showers from a shower, uh, shower showering of, uh, of events or constantly branching. Uh, indeed, initial state branches is also sometimes used. And we see the same thing here in the final state. So when the, once the partons are produced, they can start radiating off partons, which in turn can radiate off more partons, etc. You have a whole shower developing, a whole avalanche, and that is then the final state of the shower. So this is more or less the stages uh, in which uh, in which a Monte Carlo program is also built up. You find these phases uh, all built in. So um, now most of these are models. So the underlying event, we don't have a very good first principles theory calculation for that. They're very successful models, but um, they're models nevertheless. So we need them because to simulate, to do a better understand how to optimize that effector, often uh, a very, very good high order theory is useless. You want a very good simulation. And if you have a good model that does it well, that is for that purpose certainly better. The initial state showers are often phased in a way that indeed they're reconstructed from a back, what's called a backwards evolution. But that's, a, that's more of a method than something fundamental. It is much more efficient. Uh, these blobs here, uh, the hadronization phase, how do partons go into uh, mesons is also fairly unknown. For that, we also have models. We have the Loon string model. We have the local parton hadron duality. All these things have parameters in them that have been fitted to data. So uh, these are models, and they're often very good. For many purposes, it's the details are irrelevant. If you want to make a jet, all you want is a lot of energy and uh, momentum in that jet. And what happens to the partons is a probability one process. All the partons will go to hadrons. The details will matter as long as they all do. And they all do. Right? So that's a probability one process and doesn't affect the cross-section then. So uh, let's now look at these final state showers in a bit more detail. I'll mention that maybe also in the second hour. Um, but the, the key point is when you have, well, you see it from the picture, if you have showers, you have branchings, you have emissions from the initial and final state partons, then an undetermined number of them for every event. Uh, if you do an MLO calculation, you always have one extra emission. You have a loop diagram and one extra emission. And these are two components of an MLO calculation. If you want to combine the two, the parton shower and the MLO, at the level of one emission, you have an overlap. And you need to uh, do that carefully and subtract it. Now, uh, before going into the details of the final shower, let me still make one more remark about event generation. Uh, these are so-called unweighted events. I'll come back to that at the end of this lecture. So every event occurs with an intrinsic probability one, except that uh, uh, high cross-section events occur much more frequently. But once an event occurs, it's, it's there with probability one. It's not that uh, you have, when you start filling histograms, suppose you have a, a histogram, you start recording your events, then every time you put an event in a histogram, you do it with a constant. You, you don't add another factor there. I'll come back to this at the end. So these are unweighted events, just like nature. Nature does not weight its events either. It just makes some events more rarely than uh, more frequently than others. But uh, there is no different weight per event. So an event generation has unweighted events, just like nature. Uh, typically, uh, you select, when you run, when you do some of these programs, select a hard process. You decide to do a simulation for PV bar production, and then uh, let the initial state and final state shower routines, showers, generate many more partons.
So if you do ttbar production, you keep on running the code. If for every time you have an event, uh, you can have ttbar plus four partons, the next event ttbar plus 17 partons, etc. That is not a fixed number, unlike an analytical calculation where you've defined it. And then finally, uh, hadronize. Uh, you still must feed the outcome of the parton shower uh, phase into routines, into uh, functions that describe the hadronization process, had hadronize. Okay, so the, one of the most important aspects of these collisions is the shower phase, the initial state shower and the final state shower. The other stuff is non-perturbative, a bit more model dependent. We'd like to focus on the shower phase. You also see from this um, picture that since you can, ha can have an arbitrarily large number of uh, of extra partons. Uh, it is a bit like resummation, but not exactly. It's not that every event is all orders, but there's no fixed order either. You can you could get lots a large number of gluons, um, but um, it is a, it is a way of of looking at all order physics uh, through a probabilistic picture. So let's look a bit at the foundations. In particular, the something called collinear branching. Maybe we can just split the board too here. So if we consider the following situation, we have some process here and some extra partons. And here comes a parton that radiates one gluon here, A, uh, B, and C. Uh, so this is N particles. And we have one extra branching here. So this is a contribution to the cross-section for n plus 1 particles. This is a plus 1. Now, if you analyze this, this bit of the diagram here a bit more carefully, so kinematic analysis, it's really not very hard. You have to look a little carefully. Uh, in, kin in the collinear limit, So we assume that this extra emission is quite collinear to its parent. So you can make some approximations again. And then you find that the cross-section, this is for temporarily a bit of analytical work again, uh, the cross-section for n plus 1 partons can be written as that for n partons times uh, dt over t. I'll define that in a second. dz alpha x over 2 pi we hat where z is the energy of v over the energy of a and p is minus p a squared so z is the energy that is that that this part still has as the, this has radiated off as a fraction and t is sort of the virtuality of this line. And we think of t as small, right? Because this splitting is quite collinear. That means that the virtuality here is not very large. So in that limit, you have here this formula. So it's a bit of uh, differential in this invariant mass, in this off shellness, in the energy fraction. And then here is a sort of branching strength, alpha s over 2 pi, times this symbol p, which you've seen before in the algebraic Parisi equation. Here it is just in this case for quarks, 1 plus z squared over 1 minus z, no plus description, just that. So that we got no plus. Uh, you might want to write for yourself no plus distribution there. It's just uh, this, this function. So it just says this gives you the strength of the possibility <coughs> of branching. Okay. Now you see, notice the structure here, the, the, the cross-section, which is a probability of itself. Uh, for n plus 1 partons, depends on that for n partons times a factor. And this is a typical for a uh, Markov process. Defining 
characteristic is that you have a system that evolves and ex every evolution step only depends on one, the, the previous one. It doesn't depend on the previous, previous, or on all the ones for the whole history. Markov is just step after step after step. And this is a name that you see a lot in part on the chalice. So n plus 1 uh, depends only on n. Depends only on the previous step. Now, how to show this? Uh, well, if you want, you can look at uh, at e plus e minus, where you radiate off <coughs> from either leg in the uh, so derived from e plus e minus two q q bar g. So you have here these diagrams. You square them, sum them. Uh, limit your phase space interval to the collinear region, and you'll find this uh, expression. So I'll put this a bit in brackets uh, to give you a hint. It's about a page of work. <coughs> so this is for uh, collinear branching. A uh, very nice property. So uh, particles can be radiated off in any direction, but for particle showers, really, you should think of emission either very collinearly or possibly soft. Or the regime we always look at uh, in QCD. This collinear branch, now let's look at the soft sector. And here we have a uh, look at coherent branching. And again, since we look at the soft uh, case, um, we look now at, uh, we can again use the, our friend, the itonal approximation. Uh, let me do that uh, on that board. So the picture then we have is, uh, let me draw the diagrams in the way that we've done before uh, in this cut notation where to the right of this cut is the amplitude on the left of the cut is a complex conjugate amplitude the diagram is really for the cross section the clever way of writing diagrams for cross sections not for scattering amplitudes so we have here the possibilities of having a blue one going like this a blue one going like this go, go like this or like this in the soft approximation. Well, if we've done this before, I'm just going through it again. So uh, I claim that this is zero. Why is that? Sorry? That's right. You get meet P1 squared here as a, in the soft approximation, and here P2 squared. So these are both zero in the soft approximation. And these will give you uh, that m squared is p1 dot p2 over uh, p1 dot q. Let me call the momentum now <coughs> q just to have a change. So this is q. Right, so that's the, uh, that comes from these two diagrams only. And they must be summed coherently. So sum first and then square. Now this form we've seen before, but it actually has a property that we haven't addressed yet. Um, so we can split this up. Um, let me first rewrite this a bit. Uh, in the following form, 1 over the energy of the gluon squared. And then here, so I, you see that the size of P2 scales out. It's only the energy of the gluon is a dimensionable parameter. I'll scale that out, but the rest should be angles. So the answer is here, 1 minus the cosine theta of the Q-Q-bar pair 
divided by 1 minus the cosine of the quark gluon, 1 minus the cosine of the antiquark gluon. Right, that is the analytic form. We assume that P1 and P2 go, go out along the z-axis. So this expression, the purely angular expression, uh, I call uh, W Q Q bar, and in some sense it's an antenna. It's a dipole, right? A Q Q bar dipole that can emit from either way. And you must, if you sum the two and then square, it acts like an antenna. That's what an antenna does, it emits. So this we can split up. We can write this antenna function W Q Q bar as a sum over uh, Q Q bar with a Q in the uh, superscript and a Q Q bar with a Q bar superscript, where uh, this one is can be written as one half W Q Q bar plus one over one minus cosine theta P Z minus 1 over 1 minus cosine theta q bar z. <coughs> uh, you can check if I define the other way, then you add them up. These two terms cancel between this and this, and you just have this one left. You, you say, ah, oh, fine, but why did I write it this way? And why, why add something which has to stack against the other term? What's the point? The point is the following. Each of these has a very, each of these has a very interesting property. <coughs> In interesting, I agree with the word interesting, interim uh, property. Namely, if I integrate from zero to two pi over the azimuthal part of the angle between the quark and the quark and the gluon of W Q Q Q bar of this expression, I get the following result. I get one over one minus the cosine of theta Q G if theta Q G is smaller than theta Q Q bar. Can you read this? No. Uh, no, no. If theta Q G is smaller than theta Q Q bar, and zero otherwise, and that's really the exact result. So this nice form has this expression, and it's a it's a bit of a you know, very tricky integral, but it has this beautiful result. Now, what does this mean? It really means something called angular ordering. So if I have a process and it emits the first emission, let's assume that was uh, called that angle, uh, well, let's do it this way. This is QQ bar. And this is the angle QQ bar. Then the second emission uh, must happen with an angle smaller than that. So this angle must be smaller than the opening angle. The next emission must have an even smaller angle, and, and so forth. You get an ever decreasing angle. And it, thanks to this nice property. So that, that, that means that if you have a fast particle that starts radiating, sorry, a fast particle that starts radiating to showers, more partons, they will stay angularly confined. They will not uh, branch out over all of space in the soft limit. Right, so if, uh, if, if you don't have this expression, this is the soft, the iconal expression, then other things can happen. But certainly this is uh, a very, this is the most important part of the amplitude in that region. So it is much more likely that partons really stay ever closer to a direction than that they have one part on suddenly halfway down the shower make a very large angle. So that's why 
It's a bit of explanation for jets. That's why things stay in the same direction. So that's really possible thanks to this nice property of the soft radiation. The thing to keep in mind is that this is only true after azimuthal integration. Uh, so what Park and Chow of Monte Carlo do is they implement angular ordering anyway, but then also allow you to emit in any possible azimuthal integration, which is a bit of an error. It's a very small error if the power is addressed correctly. But you implement the property that really formally only occurs after azimuthal integration, but you can't azimuthally integrate in event generation. You sort of imitate it anyway. And it works very well with describing the data, by the way. It's not a weird thing to do. But this is a beautiful property of uh, the soft limit of branching. Oh, uh, this dot, typically, so we, we, choose a fr we choose a frame here in the first emission where it is, um, uh, sorry? Yes, so, uh, oh, this must be, well, let me double check that. Yeah, it, it's, uh, it is the azimuthal integral. Let me see where, I have to check it where it occurs in there. You have three angles in the game, q q bar, q g, and q bar g. That means they don't all occur in the same plane. So there, are, there is, it's a three-dimensional system. There will be an azimuthal angle, but I have to make it a bit clearer. So, um, so that's what Monte Carlo programs do. So. So we have now these properties of branchings. Uh, for the collinear, it's Markov. And for the soft, it is angular ordered. And uh, you can set this up in a sort of uh, iterative algorithm to uh, generate a part and shower. Um, but to appreciate the computing setup, we need to do one more thing. Uh, return to the DGLAT equation. <coughs> so um, one thing we so I've told you this whole story for the final <laughs> state. It occurs also for the initial state. Uh, so I'm returning now uh, to the initial state. I did this for the final state because it's a bit easier to show. Uh, and now I want to return to the DGLAT equation to see, uh, il illustrate an important point about setting up an algorithm for iteratively emitting uh, part and showers. So the DGLAT equation, which you remember is an evolution equation for the part and distribution function. So let me define the parameter t to be, the, to be just mu squared. And then the DGLAP equation reads d dt, uh, sorry, t d dt, phi, I also drop all the flavor labels, is alpha s over 2 phi, integral from x to 1, dz over z, t of z plus phi of x over z and t. And this expression was 1 plus z squared over 1 minus z if it's fork to fork split. But you remember the plus, right? That was an uh, important part of the whole description. So we can write this out, the right-hand side, uh, working out the plus as alpha s over 2 pi from x to 1, dz over z, t hat z, phi of x over z and t minus alpha s over 2 pi dz from 0 to 1 t hat of z phi of x and t. You see here the plus description has uh, set z to 1 in the PDF as it should. 
Uh, and this thing you can think of just as 1 plus v squared over 1 minus z without the plus description. We had this also there in the, uh, in the part on shower. So I'm just writing up uh, the, the DCLAP equation. If you think, is this a good way of, is this a good formula to somehow represent as an iterative algorithm? I would say no. All right, there is uh, this thing that maybe you could do, and then you have to subtract something at a different spot. It seems like a not particularly useful way of representing a thing. So we can rewrite the DLAP equation in a very clever way uh, to really give it a probabilistic meaning. To give this a probabilistic meaning, introduce a factor delta of t, which is minus the integral from t0 to t, d2 prime cosine. Delta of t is the exponent of minus the integral t0 of t dt prime of t prime uh, integral from z from 0 to 1 alpha s over 2 pi p hat of z. So a bit funny to do this, the exponent more or less of this last term. And this is known as the Sudakov form factor. And it will get a meaning uh, in a moment. So uh, with this factor delta of t, we can now rewrite the DGLAP equation in a very interesting way. So I'll write it down, and we can, ch and then we can uh, check what the meaning is. So it will be d d t of the combination phi of x and t divided by the Sudakov form factor equals d z over z alpha s over two pi p hat of z phi of x over z and t divided by this factor delta. So now these, uh, if I write it in this way, the two terms have become one. You can sort of see how it happens. If I act with dt on the numerator, that you get the first term back. But if I act on the denominator, I bring down the second term and the exponents will all cancel. So it's a bit of a clever way of writing it. Now let me solve this equation. I can, this, I can write the solution as follows. Phi of x and t equals uh, phi of x and t zero times delta of t plus the integral from t0 to t, dt prime, t prime, delta of t, delta of t0, so t prime, uh, dz over z, alpha s over 2 pi, p hat of z, phi of x over z and t. So I can solve this by iteration, by substituting uh, uh, in what uh, the next step is. And uh, you can check that if I substitute this in here, it solves it. But in this form, we can give it our meaning. So let's on this axis plot uh, x, and here the variable t. Now t was really mu squared. 
but let's imagine it as a sort of time, an evolution of time, a parameter that constantly increases as you evolve. It acts like a time in that sense. And here is t0, and here is some intermediate t prime. And here is the, uh, the t that we want, this t. Here is the value 1, and here is the value x0, and here is the value x. So in this plane, I can plot this process. So where I want to end up, I start at t0, or where I want to end up is at the value x, at the coordinate, at the coordinate x, at the time t. Now the first, um, uh, the, the first um, term uh, basically starts at x and goes all the way to t. The second term starts at a, a larger value of, uh, of x. there, evolves to a certain point t prime, then there's a branching here, there's a splitting, right, this is a splitting, uh, at, at the time t prime to the time t, and then again goes to the time t. So these are two paths that are being followed. And so going down uh, at a fixed t is a branching, is a, spli is a splitting indicated here. Nothing happening is just going on. Right, it means there's no p involved. So from this point of view, uh, this delta means the non-splitting probability, the non-branching probability. So what is the probability of something starting at x and surviving all the way to t that has a probability. If brankings can occur, there is also a probability for not branching. And that is what the pseudocoff form factor uh, defines. And here we have the probability of not branching until the time t prime, then a branching happening, and then again the probability of no further branching until the time t. That's what this ratio indicates. So when you think of splittings and branchings, you must include something that you were not used to in normal analytical formula, the possibility of something not happening. But if you have a bunch of radioactive nuclei, or the probability of one nucleus decaying at a certain time t, there's a strength of decay probability at that time t, but it must come together with the probability that it hasn't decayed yet. Otherwise it wouldn't be there to decay. And that's what the meaning of the pseudocoff form factor is. So we have here a beautiful probabilistic interpretation of the Dirac equation. I have not approximated things, I've just rewritten it. And we now have a very nice algorithmic scheme here. The Dirac equation also means that. Uh, a way of constantly evolving probabilities not branching, then a branching happens, and then probably nothing happening for a while, and then another branching happens, etc. So the Dirac equation, which you want to have in your Monte Carlo, has a probabilistic interpretation. So we have now lots of elements which uh, lead to a probabilistic picture. <coughs> I can iterate the solution to uh, two branchings and it will just be the same. I can just repeat this, substitute uh, into here this, and also get a two branching term, etc. You can keep on doing it. The solution can be iterated. So we have it iterated branchings, iterated uh, shower really. Uh, and then we have some properties of these branchings too. Uh, the collinear branching has a Markov character, only depends on the previous step. And if it's a soft branching, uh, it is an angular order point. So we have no elements for writing compute, computer code, which we will certainly not do, that's what we do for specialists, but at least the principles I think are here. And they very much rest on what we've discussed already in the class. Right, but now from a new point of view. Also here you see this is, a, this is this not upset the Markov process. It's, uh, it only depends on the previous branching, what can happen. There is no difference. Uh, it's not that this depends if branching happens on something four branches ago. This happens branching after branching, etc. 
So what is the parking channel then? Is a <coughs> practical implementation Parking shower is a uh, implementation. Implementation uh, of the probabilistic, probabilistic branching picture using four momenta. So if you have a part on, I just draw straight lines, I don't care if there's quarks or gluons, uh, you can have such a branching probability or branching history. And at every vertex there's a branching, and between the vertices there is no branching. And we can suit a transform factor for that bit of line, in the sense that you must represent that nothing happens there also. That all is encoded in the algorithms that have been written for this. So there is a sort of time-like parameter that goes from low, from high to low, the mu squared, in the deep and the algebraic reason equation. In practice, uh, sometimes also they use uh, the transverse momentum squared. Sometimes the angle is used as a parameter which, at every step, decreases. There's different type of evolution parameters that different implementations use. Okay, so this is, I've been talking a lot about probabilities. Uh, let me give you a little bit of a picture of that, um, if you have never done this before. And also, so, so far we've only been talking about the shower part of this lecture. I haven't discussed that town in southern France yet. So, uh, a little aside on Monte Carlo integration. Who, uh, who among you has ever done this before? Monte Carlo integration. Well, some of you. Uh, it's, a, it's a very cute way of doing it. I recommend it to everyone just for, for, for fun, really. So, Monte Carlo integration is a way of doing integral numerically. So, uh, let the integral i be equal to. Let's do it for one variable first, from, from x1 to x2, from some function x. Then what does the Monte Carlo method say? Well, I can uh, multiply this di distance with 1 over n, the sum over i is 1 to n of f of xi. I put two little stars there for later use, where xi are pseudo random numbers. Which are lie in the interval between zero and one. Um, so you cannot only nature can make really random numbers. There are algorithms for making pseudo random numbers that to any human who does not know the algorithm, it looks perfectly random. Um, but they do always have a period. If you have a huge number, then usually th they start repeating themselves, but the period is uh, gigantic. And n, uh, think of n as typically a 10 to the 6 or so. So you just throw a 10 to the 6 times a random number in your function that evaluates f, sum them all up, divide by n, and multiply this, and that will be a very good approximation for your integral. So that will lead to i n, the numerical estimate of the integral, and the error is typically of order one over the square root of n. That's why I did the side side here. Yeah, oh, that's right. Yeah. So, the, but uh, that included in the definition of f. Yeah. You can also take this to zero and one, then there is no such factor. So, uh, so that's what you want to, and it's. Uh, it's quite easy to do. There are refinements of this with stratified sampling and important samples to decrease the error. What is the advantage of a Monte Carlo interval? Well, it's in 
particle physics, you have often four or five particles in the final state. Each of them has four components. You have to integrate over all these components. That's a 20-dimensional interval, or at least a very high number. Uh, turns out, uh, this does not depend on number of dimensions, also not the error. So the Monte Carlo integral you can just do, throw in then more points, but uh, it doesn't become that much harder as you increase the dimensionality of the integral. It's very powerful in that way. And these days, getting lots of random numbers is very cheap. Right? It's very computers are so fast, it's quite easy to do. So what you can do uh, is if you have, let's take the interval 0 to 1, if this is uh, 0 and 1, what you can do is uh, get a sh also a sense of what the shape of f is by making lots of little bins and filling the bins. So if you have, if you generate a random number xi that sits in this bin, uh, fill this bin with uh, uh, with the, the value f of x. Right? So then you get in the end uh, some kind of shape that corresponds to your function, the histogram. So bins are filled with weights f of x i. Okay, so this is what a Monte Carlo integration uh, does. Now, when you think now again, having seen this, think back of a cross section. So, a cross section. is, uh, after all, a high-dimensional integral. Over phase space. And these days, people even try to do loop integrals numerically. So you can do that with Monte Carlo techniques if you... It's a bit subtle, but uh, if you want to do this numerically, that's certainly a very good method. So uh, for that, you can uh, see it as see it as a Monte Carlo integral where every time you pick a set of random numbers, so for n momenta, I'm sorry, that might be touch wood, but for n uh, uh, for momenta, need 3n minus 4 random numbers to make a general set of n four momenta. Uh, let's see if you can uh, argue why. Why is it 3n minus 4? I make 4n final state momenta. I make, uh, so I need n final state momenta each of four components. So you think I need 4n. But it's only three and minus four. Each particle is on shell. That makes it for every uh, momentum only three necessary. And where does the minus four come from? From overall momentum conservation. Yeah. So that's uh, that's why I get three and minus four. So and the way you then use uh, such a Monte Carlo program for n final particles, you uh, you take three n minus four random numbers, and that makes, and that you make four momenta out of that. That's an event. So you parameterize four momenta in terms of these random numbers. You set, you select the set of three n minus four, make uh, n four momenta out of that, and that's one event. You do with it what you want to do with it, and then you, the next event comes. It can go very fast. Right, so that's how you think of. And making cross sections. Now, doing it this way and as an integral, uh, this is very much what people ought to do. I've written codes like this. Uh, 
uh, that you have an algorithm of calculation and then you set it up nu as a numerical Monte Carlo integral. You use some random numbers to define your two or three particle final states. And you keep, and once you've done that, you want to make a distribution, you define a histogram, and every time you have, an, say, in, in transverse momentum of some particle that you've done the calculation for, and then for a certain value pt that you get out, you fill it with the integrand evaluated at that function of pt. So again, a weighted integral. Every, every time you make an entry, you uh, raise the level of that bin proportional to the cross-section there. So this gives weighted uh, it's a weighted Monte Carlo in the sense that the, if you if you have a, a function that behaves like this, and here are your bins, then the reason that the bins here will be not as large is not because they get less events, but because the weight here, the integrand, is smaller there. It's just very much what like what you expect. Your m squared, your matrix element squared, is smaller. This is very much a numerical implementation of your analytical result. But it's not what nature does. Remember I said at the beginning, nature does, does something else. Nature gets the same shape, if you, the two agree, not by entering this with a different weight. It just ends with less events here. And more events here, all with the same weight, Let's say one. It does not enter, it does not give you some sort of probability half the event here. You don't even know what that means. It just makes less of the high PT events than of the medium PT events. And that's why you get that shape. We as theorists can define something called the weight, where you have always the same event in every bin, except here the weights are smaller, according to m squared, the matrix element squared. So we're doing the theorist thing here, but it's not what nature does. So to, imi to imitate nature, and this is also very much what occurs in Monte Carlo. Need to unweight the events. And that's a very important part of part on shower Monte Carlo. Because these Monte Carlo programs, you don't want to have a numerical version of an analytical calculation. You want to have a simulation of nature. You want to really do what nature also does. Make less events here, more events there, but all with the same weight. So how do you do that? And uh, the most, I'll explain one of the two methods. And it's a lot of fun. Let me do it here. So unweighting. with the von Neumann hit and miss method. Hit and miss. I think there's also a game called Battleship, right, where you have to hit and miss if you hit the opponent's uh, cruiser or aircraft carrier. Uh, it's also known as accept and projection method. And, he, and here's how it goes. So imagine uh, we have a function between 0 and 1. And here's our function. I'll just pick a function. This is a function f of x. This is x, and here is um, f of x. So, and the integral underneath f of x is written like this. And in Monte Carlo method, it will be this form, plus an error, or ignore the error. So every time I, ha I pick an x, I have the 100 bins, say. I mean, uh, that's what I define. And as uh, x is uh, 0.55, is it OK, in the 55 bins, how much should I raise the uh, height of the bin by uh, the value f of x i? Right. So that's the weighted integral. How do you unweight it? I'll do the following trick. Uh, suppose we know uh, C such that C is always larger than F of X. So C is an upper bound. Then you can set up the following uh, equation. 
No, just the following out. One is to select uh, a random number x between 0 and 1. This is a random number. Now comes the crucial step. Select another random number. Select y, also random number between 0 and c. <coughs> now, step 3. If y is larger than f of x, reject. If i is smaller than f of x, accept. And reject means go back to step one. And step four is uh, uh, enter or um, make entry in histogram. with constant weight, with weight 1. Make entry in histogram with weight 1. Sorry for the bad writing. That's no, because that's weighted numbers involved here. So let's see how this works. So suppose uh, I, I choose a random number. Uh, it, hap it, it happens to be chosen in this region. Then only if the y random number is in this region, do I reject it? But that's not very likely to happen. Most events will be accepted. Because if y is in this direction, and the distance is only small here, so uh, it's very likely that in, for the x is here, the event will be accepted. Here, if my x is here, then it's quite likely that the event will be rejected by the choice of y, because it's all this stay in the y, di y direction in which it can lie, so it's most probably going to be rejected. So in this way, you generate the shape in an indirect uh, way uh, using the second random number through an acceptance rejection trick. It's very cute. Right? It's a little bit of thinking. Uh, but it's, you produce exactly the same curve this way. Except now you make entries always with weight 1. You get precisely the same shape. Now, uh, I'll just need... Uh, a uh, few more minutes, and then I'm done. I hope you, uh, you don't mind. So this looks very uh, cool, and uh, seems the complete solution to our unweighting question. Can we make a Monte Carlo for theorists into something that really simulates nature? So uh, the disadvantages uh, of uh, hit and miss it's used a lot uh, in Monte Carlo, but it doesn't solve all the problems. Disadvantages are uh, not always very efficient. If you have a function that is not nice like this, but falls very fast like this, and it can often happen, then uh, for this part, you, you're most of the time going to be gen uh, generating random numbers which are going to be rejected. Uh, because this, if this is a bound, you're almost always going to be rejected. So it takes a long time to get an event accepted. So that's not very efficient. Um, uh, and also for these bounds, not always easy to find bounds. You need to know uh, that you really have one value which is really above the whole interval. Otherwise, the whole method doesn't work. Still, it's important enough to uh, to do. So that's one algorithm that's used a lot. And the second one, which I will only describe and not give a uh, explain in this nice way, is called the uh, veto algorithm. And that brings us back to the parking shower. So the parking shower, I told you, is a bit related to radioactive decay. You can have something happen, uh, and then at a certain point in time, a branching or a splitting or a decay happens, but you also need to take into account that nothing has happened until then. So radioactive decay, or the part and shower, have the following form, P of T, the probability of something happening, a branching, 
at time t equal the strength of something happening at time t times the exponent of minus t0 to t dt prime f to t prime. This was our pseudotop form factor, uh, now a bit simplified. So this is the probability of happening something at time t times the probability of something not having happened yet at time t. I'll leave it as an exercise to show that if you sum over the probabilities of something happening at any time, then you get uh, f, f squared, f cubed, etc. And then when you add it all up, you find that you get an exponent of plus this thing times the exponent of minus thing, which gives you one. And indeed, the, the sum of all probabilities of either something happening, of something happening, including nothing happening, should be one. Like there is no other uh, uh, possible answer. So this is the probability of something happening. Now, this, this is the parton shower basic formula, except there they use four momenta rather than one parameter. And this is then the function that you'd like to unweight. But hit and miss is not particularly efficient here. So uh, the Vito algorithm uh, unweights uh, this form. this uh, function, functional form. It's a bit more involved and it's best if you study it by yourself and get confused for a while and maybe implement it yourself in a toy code uh, if you're interested. So uh, so this is indeed very much used in Parton Shower Monte Carlo to simulate the whole Parton Shower and it includes the non-emission probability which is a key element of the Parton Shower which also emerged I remind you in our uh, D glass interpretation through the pseudotop form factor. <coughs> so, uh, this more or less concludes the story on the parton shower. Let me just give you maybe a few words on the status of things now. Uh, not a long set of words, but a few words. So, these are the key elements of a parton shower that I've described to you. This is a very different way of thinking about theory. You don't think of theory as the event producing a formula which you make a plot, but a way of producing theory as an iterative algorithm. And that's great for experiments, because they love this stuff, because it's exactly what they can use to test their detector efficiencies, to simulate nature really as they see it in their detector. So if you can do, make the best possible part in shower, Monte Carlo, as a theorist who likes to do higher orders, that is certainly uh, very advantageous, advantageous. So the Monte Carlo status, and this is a huge field, uh, so I will certainly have to do it justice. It's so it is a probabilistic way of doing part and shower, but it's a recent, uh, so these days it is part and shower plus next to leading order has now been combined in a consistent way without double counting. So uh, codes like MC and MLO, you can guess what the name means. Powhack, uh, that's uh, part on something, something, well, I forget the abbreviation. And, a, and a, uh, I think one other. So this is really a major field in QCD. It used to be two different communities, people building part in showers and people doing high order calculations or doing the summation. Uh, but this has in recent years come together. So the MC and the analytic community have come together. And, uh, and an example is such things as such codes. How do you combine high orders with Monte Carlo? So I know certainly I've worked on uh, partly on this one myself. It requires you really to change your way of thinking. If you're used to producing formulas uh, and then have to think in a probabilistic way, that's uh, not easy. Mm. So um, there's a huge development here. There's fantastic codes um, that almost make 
uh, theorists who do standard MLO calculations superfluous because that a lot of that is now automa automated, as I mentioned. But also that matched in an automatic way to Monte, to Monte, Monte Carlo, to parting showers. So in the tools for a theorist uh, that QCD theorists have built over the past years have really been impressive, um, not just at the fixed order level, but also at this uh, Monte Carlo level. So I think this may be a good point at least to stop uh, the last of the new topics. And then after the break, we'll have a bit of a review of the whole course. Are there any questions at this point? Need to think a little bit. Okay, so should we have some tea? Yeah, it's your this or this? <laughs> <laughs> I decided to stop that one after.